Hello, I'm Dr. Joel Gelfand. I'm gonna to talk to you uh, about psoriasis treatment update, a focus on targeted therapies. And I am your faculty, uh, Professor of Dermatology and Epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania, where I also run our psoriasis and therapy treatment center. These are my disclosures. And these are the learning objectives for your reference. So just a quick review of psoriasis epidemiology and disease burden. It's a very common disease, affects over 8 million people in the United States. Uh, roughly 20% of patients have mild, have moderate to severe disease where they would require systemic agents uh, to manage it. Um, and in this year where we've been learning more about the importance of, of uh, health equity in the field of dermatology, I just wanna point out some older research that uh, my team has done over the years, uh, showing that in fact, uh, psoriasis is pretty common in African-Americans. Uh, that they're more likely to have moderate to severe disease compared to Caucasians, uh, but despite this, they are less likely to receive biologic therapy. Uh, so we have some work to do uh, to better understand this sort of health uh, disparity. Uh, the other thing that's important to understand about psoriasis is that's a systemic disease. It's not just a skin disease. Uh, patients have a higher risk of things like major cardiovascular events, and mortality, diabetes, and kidney disease culminating in five years of life lost. This is especially true in those with more extensive skin disease. This is a disease that has a lot of burden for patients. I think the qualitative research actually is very helpful for clinicians to understand the type of themes that patients think about. Uh, so one issue is that people feel alone. They feel isolated. They never talk about it with anyone. Uh, it's also an all-encompassing disease. Uh, they think about scratching and bathing and putting on ointments 24 hours a day. And on remission, uh, I suddenly feel myself singing for joy. It's like getting out of prison. You're free. There's nothing holding you back anymore. And so these are the type of concepts that your patients will often verbalize uh, to you in clinic if you ask about it. And the third bullet point, of course, is why it's such a pleasure to practice uh, in, in modern times. We have such great therapeutic options for patients, where for many of our patients, we can uh, get them to a stage where they can sing for joy, that they can feel free uh, of their psoriasis. Now, a nice uh, article that came out a couple of years ago about uh, health related quality of life and psoriasis tells you that there's a penalty to pay for when disease is getting worse. Uh, basically, data from clinical trials uh, showing that when you're withdrawing therapy from a patient, uh, when a patient's disease is getting worse, as opposed to uh, stable or getting better, uh, there's a twofold greater impact on health related quality of life when the skin disease is returning uh, or, or flaring. And that's an important thing to be mindful of uh, when it comes to thinking about interrupting therapy. Now, the other thing is that psoriasis continues to be a very stigmatizing disease. This is recent work that we published in the JAD, basically showing that roughly a third of the population thinks psoriasis is contagious, only affects the skin, it's not a serious disease, and expresses a strong desire to stay distant from people with psoriasis. You know, 40% don't want to shake hands with someone with psoriasis or wouldn't want to let someone psoriasis in their home or marry into their family. Uh, this is a striking uh, level of stigmatization for psoriasis, despite all we now understand about this disease. We have a variety of treatment strategies to manage chronic psoriasis, from topical agents to phototherapy, uh, to pills by mouth, to injectable biologics, and this armamentarium is expanding. Uh, despite all this prog progress, psoriasis still remains challenging to treat. Uh, many patients will respond well to therapy, uh, but then will we'll lose response to treatment over time. And so it's really incumbent upon the clinician to be fully aware of the full gamut of treatments available for their patients uh, so we can manage this disease successfully over the long term. Uh, also, new uh, evolving concepts of what it means to have, uh, you know, being a candidate for systemic therapy, if you will, whether this be pills, biologics, or phototherapy. You know, a traditional uh, definition was bias over serum more than 10%, but also things like disease involving special areas like the face, the palms, the soles, the genitals, the scalp, and the nails. These are areas that don't respond well to topical therapies or cause a lot of burden for our patients or just simply failure topical therapy. Your patient with four or 5% bias for area who is unable to maintain, maintain control of their disease with topical agents, they are people we would consider uh, for systemic therapy based on this uh, IPC uh, guidance statement. And uh, it's important to recognize that moderate severe disease 
continue to be uh, very undertreated despite our advances uh, in therapeutic uh, treatments uh, available to us. Uh, and so this is something that we're trying to move the needle on uh, so patients uh, can have a reduced burden of the disease. And as I alluded to earlier, uh, feel like they are sort of uh, uh, able to jump for joy and, and feel like they're out of prison uh, from dealing with their chronic psoriasis. Again, uh, continuing the theme, uh, you know, uh, we've made a lot of progress, but at the same time, uh, that progress is not fully extending itself into clinical practice. Uh, so this is PQRS reporting from the AAD showing uh, actually our performance rate, our ability to hit outcome targets for psoriasis. And these are fairly simple measures to hit, you know, uh, PGA less than equal to two, so that's mild disease, or bias per se, less than 3%. Uh, in 2015, the data was about 70% performance rate uh, in 2017, uh, more people reporting and the performance rate was going down 60%, reminding us that it is challenging uh, to get people uh, to clear or almost clear skin in, in the real world setting. Uh, also important to recognize that there's anatomical areas that are very difficult to treat. Coming back to my earlier slide about uh, what we consider to be candidates for systemic therapy. So genital psoriasis, scalp psoriasis, psoriasis of the palms, uh, psoriasis of the nails. And you know, one of the hardest uh, types of psoriasis to treat is, is a variation of this disease, uh, palmoplantar plantar pustulosis. Um, and here, Sekikinumab uh, evaluated uh, this drug uh, in a rigorous RCT uh, and it improved uh, the PP Posi 75 but it failed to meet the primary endpoint. And you can see the, you know, the, the clearance rates uh, much lower than what we, what we see when we're treating plaque disease. So palmoplantar plantar pustulosis uh, remains uh, a disease uh, that we don't necessarily have uh, effective therapies for. And, and often it's individualization with the patient trying a variety of different uh, mechanisms of action to see what works best for them. Uh, talking about special sites still, uh, you know, genital disease, this is a lot of burden for patients. And to their credit, uh, ixacuzumab was studied in patients with primarily genital disease and, and showed excellent treatment response. And so in my clinical practice, patients with isolated genital psoriasis, this is cl clearly an indication for patients to be treated with a biologic. Um, and often this type of data can be useful working with payers uh, to get a medication covered for a patient. Now, as I alluded to earlier, a big challenge uh, with our biologics is, is loss of response uh, over time. On the right side of your screen is sort of a little bit of older data. You know, generally speaking, uh, the uh, 12, 23 pathway used to kinumab tend to have the longest persistence, if you will. Um, and then there's sort of variable persistence of the TNF inhibitors and uh, IL-17 inhibitors, in this case, uh, secukinumab, although more data is needed uh, to fully understand these relationships. On the left side of your screen is some older data from, from my clinic, from uh, a study we did across the United States. Uh, the histograms basically show what we, what we saw in clinical practice, the odds of being clear, almost clear, when a patient was following up the horizontal bars, what they should have achieved based on the clinical trials. And so this is a reminder that, uh, that our therapies, although they work quite well uh, in real world settings where our patients may not represent the clinical trial patients, uh, or they may be losing response over time, uh, we may not have the same uh, response rates as we may predict from the trial data. And, and these are the factors that are associated with uh, decreasing drug persistence or drug survival. So women, people who are overweight, people who are smokers, prior failure to biologics. Um, uh, and other work that we've done, we've shown that 50% of patients giving a prescription for a biologic did not get a second prescription for that same biologic. So that statistic there is probably an issue also adherence uh, or insurance barrier problems. So just a, a, something for clinicians to be aware of, you know, a patient comes in, we have a great biologic to offer them, and the probability of that patient going on the biologic, staying on it, uh, is still kind of a coin toss. So there's a lot of um, you know, uh, barriers uh, to care for our patients. But then the other bullet points about what are the predictors for why people lose response or don't maintain themselves on therapy, this is important to keep in mind when you're deciding, am I gonna change mechanism of action as patient or not in terms of their biologic? You know, someone who, a female patient who's overweight, maybe a smoker who's already gone through a drug or two, 
you know, you may want to hold on to that therapy and try and make it work as long as you can. So you're not cycling through therapies too rapidly and then running out of treatment options for the patient. Just touch on the pathophysiology of psoriasis for a bit. Uh, so this is a disease of localized and systemic inflammation. Uh, it's a classic TH1, TH17 disease uh, characterized by uh, epidermal hyperperforation, angiogenesis, uh, and dysregulated uh, genetics and, and gene expression. And the data on genetics continues to expand. And this is sort of uh, some little pearls to be aware of. Uh, there's 65 susceptibility loci identified, but still most common is HLA uh, CW6. Uh, several uh, uh, susceptibility loci have been identified, many of which we actually have drugs targeting, uh, including TIC2 and IL-23. 75% um, of psoriasis heritability is not explained by current uh, knowledge, so there's a lot more to discover. Uh, HLA B27 increases the risk of psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis. But interestingly, HLA-6 is not associated with psoriatic arthritis. Uh, Mendelian randomization studies demonstrate obesity is a causal risk factor for developing psoriatic disease. So another reminder of why it's important for people at risk for psoriasis to try to maintain a healthy body weight. Um, and there's some pharmacogenomics data evolving. So people who are hla cw 6 negative psoriasis patients with psoriatic arthritis are six times more likely to respond to add a limb mab compared to used to kidney mab. So that's potentially uh, you know, something that can be used in clinical practice, so it's not currently there yet. And then finally, a variety of mutations have been shown to drive uh, pustular psoriasis. Genetic counseling is also important to be aware of. You, know, you should be aware that uh, only 40% of patients have a fa positive family history. So this is often reassuring to patients. They say, well, no one in my family has psoriasis. And so you can let them know, actually, most people don't have a family history. And this is because um, uh, of the complex genetic trait that this disease is. That being said, psoriasis is a relatively heritable disease. Uh, and so if the patient has uh, psoriasis, um, you know, the, the likelihood of their child developing psoriasis over their lifetime is roughly 28%. Uh, and so it's important that uh, people uh, sort of at least be aware of the probability of, of, of this issue. Talk a little about the immunopathogenesis. You sort of have, you know, triggers early on that uh, trigger the innate immune system result in an adaptive immune response. Uh, and we have a variety of uh, treatments that target these pathways at multiple different areas. Uh, so TNF, uh, we have several uh, approved for psoriasis uh, that uh, uh, sort of upstream in the pathophysiology of this disease. We have used to kinumab, which blocks IL-12 and 23. Uh, we then have uh, three uh, approved uh, IL-23 inhibitors, including additional ones under development. Uh, we have therapies that target uh, the cytokine IL-17A, uh, and bimikizumab, which is under investigation, targets A and F. And, and then we have brodalumab, which is a receptor blocker of IL-17. So rational drug development, we understand the pathophysiology of uh, psoriasis. There's also a sort of rational uh, prediction uh, of potential susceptibility to infections uh, based on uh, where we are uh, in the process of, 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 of modulating the immune response to people with psoriasis. Uh, so for example, we know when we're targeting uh, therapies that are in the IL-17, IL-17A and F pathway, uh, that's very important for candida uh, infections. And so it's not surprising we see those type of infections in patients uh, treated with those biologics. So some general principles of biologic therapy, you know, they're generally considered to be immunosuppressive. And, and by that, I mean, they all have warnings that can make you a little bit more prone to infections. Um, some of them also have warnings for malignancy, uh, such as the IL-1223 inhibitors or TNF inhibitors. And so uh, it's important to consider things like age-appropriate cancer screening for patients to recommend it, uh, can make sure they're up to date on uh, age-appropriate vaccinations, uh, including uh, one of the COVID-19 vaccines, uh, TB screening is supposed to be done at baseline uh, and usually annually. Um, some of the newer guidance suggests doing it annually only if they have risk factors for TB, but prescribing information often recommends uh, annual follow-up for that. Uh, be aware of infections. Uh, they should generally hold their psoriasis therapy in most cases, treat infections appropriately, and, and there's many nuances to managing uh, these biologics, and the choice is often driven by uh, insurance and cost issues. 
want to make sure we're all on the same page about what we're looking at here. So uh, our outcomes, our primary outcome is called a POSI 75. More recently, it's now a POSI 90. Uh, and so as our therapies have gotten more effective, we've raised the bar for our primary endpoint. And you can see on the screen that, you know, POSI 75 is pretty good, but you still have a fairly amount of residual disease there in the abdomen, the arms, uh, the legs. The POSI 90, you are pretty close to clear, as this gentleman shown in the week 16. And that results in a better clinical outcome for the patient. And, and that's shown on this uh, slide here. This is clinical practice data we published a while back from my group, uh, basically showing that if you are only almost clear of disease, but not completely clear, your patient has about 20% odds of having enough impairment and health related quality of life that you as the clinician should be discussing with the patient considering changing their therapy. Um, whereas if they're clear, virtually all patients who are clear um, uh, have minimal effect on health related quality of life. And this gives you a sense of the, the armamentarium we have available to us and the likelihood we can achieve POSI 90. And this is pretty remarkable. So first, you know, our oral therapies don't do great at achieving POSI 90. Methotrexate or Premolest, really low probability of getting there, okay? Uh, our TNF inhibitors, uh, you know, vary in their ability to achieve this mark, uh, have a decent rate of it, if you will. Uh, but our newer therapies, the 17s, uh, the some of the 23s and uh, not approved yet, the mechizumab, you know, have you know roughly uh, three quarters to 85 percent of patients achieving a positive 90. That's pretty remarkable if you think about that. And there's been a lot of head-to-head -head trials done out there, and this, this slide is really for reference uh, because again, you're trying to figure out well within class what drug do I want to choose, you know? And so if you're considering you know, uh, a, a 23 inhibitor versus a 17, you know, guselkimab is probably more effective than secukinumab, for example. Uh, the mekizumab is more effective than ustekinumab. Uh, Rizinkizumab uh, is more effective than ustekinumab, things of that nature. So that can help you dr drive uh, your decision making. This is uh, from a Cochrane uh, review, a very highly regarded um, uh, evidence-based medicine um, uh, source. And here they say, these are the biologics that, that are your best choice for trying to achieve a POSI 90. Basically, infliximab, ixikizumab, rizinkizumab, bimikizumab, which is not available yet, caselkimab, uh, secukinumab, and brodalumab. Okay, so if you're choosing amongst, you know, various therapies, uh, within um, within or between mechanisms, uh, this is the you other know, ones you may be thinking about, right? Uh, in terms of the most likelihood of getting a good response for your patient. Now, these are some sort of pearls from the AAD, uh, NPF Psoriasis Biologic uh, Guidelines uh, with selected recommendations. So, so for TNF inhibitors, you know, this is often helpful um, for insurance reasons. A tanner septic is recommended for moderate for for uh, for mod severe scalp psoriasis. Um, and so, if you have a patient with isolated scalp psoriasis or nail disease, uh, we have uh, guidance recommending it, and that can help you get uh, coverage. Uh, we have dosing flexibility for infliximab using a shorter interval or doses as high as ten mg per kg to individualize therapy. Uh, maintenance dose of, of, of adalimumab um, uh, at once a week instead of once every two weeks, uh, as well as use of adalimumab uh, for psoriasis affecting the palms and soles or the nails. These are nuances that will help you get your drug approved uh, for your patient by your insurer. Uh, some more recommendations for our, our more novel therapies. Use to kinumab, we recommend alternative dosing. Uh, 90 milligrams versus 45 in patients who are less than 100 kilograms for those who aren't responding well, or a higher frequency every eight weeks maintenance dose. Uh, and this is important, uh, you know, consideration for our patients. You know, each patient is an individual, and uh, our uh, treatment strategies from the FDA often uh, leave some patients not responding appropriately. And we know we can tweak the dose to get a better response for our patients. Uh, the second kidney map is also recommended for people with psoriasis in the nails. Uh, and not severe palmoplantar plaque psoriasis. Uh, again, that's not the pustulosis variant, but the plaque version. Uh, and then finally, guselkimab is recommended as a monotherapy for adults with scalp, nail, or uh, plaque type palmoplantar psoriasis. So I hope these little pearls are helpful for you uh, in getting access to these therapies for your patients uh, who have difficult to treat psoriasis. 
Now, these next couple of slides are really for reference, uh, so I won't go through them uh, in detail. Uh, these are things you sort of have available to you for quick reference. But the first thing you have to be aware of is that our treatment strategies vary uh, in their dosing interval from weekly to every 12 weeks. In general, uh, many of us and our patients would prefer to be dosed less frequently, every eight to 12 weeks. And so in that respect, you're generally looking at uh, therapies that are, that are targeting a 23 pathway. Yeah, but sometimes it's good to be dosed a little more often. You know, uh, brodalumab, an IL-17 uh, receptor blocker, it's every two weeks. Now that might sound not as advantageous, but you'll see when you treat a lot of patients that there's some people who need their 17 inhibitor, you know, every two weeks, by week three, they're flaring. And if you dose them more frequently, you get better control of their disease. So that individualized dosing is very important. Uh, so uh, in general, our, our biologics are all very well tolerated. They really, uh, you know, the common side effects are generally mild and not so clinically important. And generally, what we're worried about is, is rare uh, or idiosyncratic effects uh, that could be serious in nature. So of course, for TNF inhibitors, uh, there's concerns about serious infections and malignancy, uh, as well as demyelinization, uh, uh, congestive heart failure. And these, uh, these um, agents uh, carry black box warnings that the patients need to be counseled about. Uh, that being said, you know, in, in large head-to-head -head trials, they, they generally perform fairly similarly uh, from a safety perspective to our newer therapies as well. Um, for our newer treatments now, uh, you know, uh, that none of them have black box warnings, which is good. Uh, used to Kinumab, uh has a warning for serious infections and malignancy. Uh, as well as uh, a new uh, warning for non-infectious uh, pneumonia, uh, which came out roughly 10 years after the drug was approved. So a reminder that for our new therapies, it still takes a while to fully sort out what maybe some of the um, unusual side effects patients could have. Uh, now looking at the main 23 inhibitors, you know, the, the main uh, effects are concerns around upper respiratory tract infections, uh, serious infections are uncommon, uh, no warnings uh, for, uh, for malignancies or black box warnings. Uh, coming to the IL-17 inhibitors, uh, here again, the rates of serious infections pretty pretty low, uh, but they as a class uh, have a rare risk of, of inflammatory bowel disease. And in the case of brodalumab, this is a receptor blocker dosed every two weeks. This has a black box warning for suicidal ideation and behavior requiring a REMS program. So these are important nuances, right? You have a patient with underlying inflammatory bowel disease or perhaps a very strong family history of inflammatory bowel disease, well, maybe the 17s aren't the, the first place to start. Maybe you're better off with a 23 uh, or a TNF, for example. So now we're gonna spend some time talking all about the uh, pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, and I showed you before or earlier that, uh, that you know, the more common effects of some of our drugs are respiratory tract infections. Although it wasn't really clear if these were any different from placebo. And we started analyzing these data doing meta estimates uh, of the pivotal trials. And what we published in our three articles in JAD is that the 17s clearly have some type of signal. Uh, they have a higher rate uh, of respiratory tract infections. You have to treat roughly 30 patients for about 12 weeks to have one extra respiratory tract uh, infection or symptoms thereof in an IL-17 inhibitor compared to placebo. Uh, we saw a trend towards this effect in the IL-23s. And interestingly, we saw really no effect of uh, the TNFs. Now, the relevance of this to clinical practice is not entirely clear at this point in time. Uh, you know, we don't even know if these are truly viral infections or allergic symptoms or from some other etiology, but it is a call for action for better respiratory tract infection data and confirmatory testing of COVID-19 in clinical trial subjects. That's sort of uh, my opinion, if you will, because there's still some controversy about whether that therapies can make people more prone uh, to COVID-19. And there's been three ways that, uh, that scientists have tried to address this question. Does psoriasis treatment put you at higher risk of developing COVID-19 or having worse outcomes? The first have been registries. Uh, these are collections of spontaneous reports from around the world. They're registries for psoriasis, rheumatic disease, and inflammatory bowel disease. And generally, they've all been pretty reassuring. They seem to suggest that biologic therapies and the therapies we use in general to treat psoriasis uh, do not seem to meaningfully impact the risk of having poor outcomes uh, from psoriatic disease. Uh, 
really the one outlier therapy is prednisone. Uh, prednisone in doses of 10 milligrams or more a day is associated with a higher odds of hospitalization uh, and worse outcomes from COVID in multiple studies. And then finally, TNF inhibitors uh, seem to be associated with a, a lower risk of poor COVID outcomes compared to other therapies used in rheumatic diseases or inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, Clinic-based cohorts in psoriasis, so here these are following a bunch of patients from clinics and then comparing to the general population. These have been largely reassuring. One outlier study early in the pandemic uh, suggested that biologics are associated with a higher likelihood of being hospitalized for COVID, uh, but that study has not been confirmed uh, as more studies uh, have evolved, uh, larger studies from Italy, um, studies from uh, a single center, and then the BioBedam psoriasis registry uh, in Spain, uh, none of these have found statistically significant higher rates uh, of poor COVID outcomes in people on uh, systemic therapies and biologics. So reassuring. Finally, automated databases have been used. Uh, a large primary care system in the United Kingdom was used early in the pandemic to show roughly a 20% higher risk of mortality from COVID amongst people with rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, or psoriasis. We don't know from that data that's driven by RA and lupus or psoriasis itself uh, puts people at higher risk of COVID. And again, the other studies haven't substantiated that. So the general feeling is that psoriasis is probably not a meaningful driver of, of COVID outcomes. Uh, another large study using a global EMR system, although most of the data from the United States, showing that TNF inhibitors uh, or methotrexate or a combination thereof uh, not associated uh, uh, with a higher rate of hospitalization for COVID. So reassuring information. So this is a little summary of what we what we currently know about uh, psoriasis biologics and COVID-19 risk. Uh, the existing literature is reassuring, but somewhat limited, uh, really looking at collections of case reports uh, and small cohorts lacking internal control groups. Uh, we have a lumping of different mechanisms of action, a lack of stratification on age and the risk factors. So as a result, as clinicians, you know, when, when your patient comes in, they're 65 years old and uh, maybe they're obese and have COPD, so they're at high risk of COVID outcomes, poor COVID outcomes. We don't have great data to know for, for sure that the therapies we use will meaningfully alter their risk of poor outcomes. So there is some uncertainty remaining, although generally the data has been uh, reassuring to date. Hopefully what will emerge uh, is one, an end to the pandemic through vaccinations, uh, but in the meantime, uh, better larger scale, longer term studies uh, to uh, more rigorously uh, address these knowledge gaps. And so uh, putting on my, my hat of being the co-chair of the National Strides Foundation COVID-19 Task Force, we put out uh, more than 30 recommendations. I, I invite you to take a look at the, the website uh, and or in our papers in JAD uh, to stay up to date on these. But basically we recommend that for most patients, uh, they should stay on their psoriasis therapies during the pandemic and that they're not on psoriatic therapies, but need them, uh, we should be choosing our therapies as we would under ordinary conditions. So there's really not any data to say treatment A or B is going to be definitively better under pandemic conditions. And therefore, we should really uh, aim to treat our patients' psoriasis as effectively and safely as we can, recognizing that this is a difficult time for people, uh, and especially difficult time for patients with psoriasis who are subject to a lot of uh, stigma and discrimination due to the appearance of their skin. Uh, in a setting of a pandemic, you know, that social isolation makes things even tougher for patients. Uh, and so our goal should be to help people control their skin disease and at least relieve that one uh, burden they, need, they face during these difficult times. Uh, we also have new recommendations for the new uh, vaccines. Uh, and uh, this is both for the mRNA vaccines as well as for the new adenovirus vector vaccine from John Johnson & Johnson. And the first thing we recommend is patients should get the first COVID-19 vaccine for which they are eligible. Uh, all three vaccines available under EUA, United States, are highly effective in preventing mortality and hospitalization from COVID-19. And that's what we're really looking for. Okay. Um, systemic medications for psoriasis or psoriasis are not contraindications for any of the currently available vaccines. None of them are live vaccines. Uh, and so the vaccines are safe uh, and effective to get, even if you're on these therapies. Uh, we recommend in general patients who are getting a COVID-19 vaccine should just continue their biologic or oral therapy for psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis in most cases. Uh, we have a carve out uh, for the adenovirus 26 uh, COVID-19 vaccine. This is from John Johnson & Johnson. But people who are 60 or older with at least one comorbidity, so these are people at high risk for poor COVID outcomes, 
that's a population where you may consider holding methotrexate for two weeks uh, after their vaccine in order to theoretically boost their response to the vaccine. Now, in that case, uh, this is data derived from a, a study of, of, of people with RA getting a flu shot, where it was shown that holding methotrexate for two weeks resulted in marginally better um, antibody responses in the blood. We don't know if there'll be clinically significant benefit of, of holding methotrexate for a couple of weeks after getting the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but something for you to consider if you share decision-making with your patients. Where do our recommendations come from? Uh, they come from a, uh, a deep dive into the literature of what is known about the effects of our vaccines, uh, uh, the effects of our therapies on vaccines, such as the influenza vaccine or pneumococcal vaccine. And, and generally speaking, um, it doesn't seem like most of our therapies you know, meaningfully alter vaccine response, with the exception of methotrexate, which seems to uh, consistently uh, suppress uh, antibody titer responses to some of the vaccines we use. All right, we're going to uh, you know uh, finish up now with um, with some new and, and emerging therapies uh, to be aware of. So, uh, mirinkizumab is an IL twenty three receptor. Uh, I'm sorry, IL twenty three inhibitor uh, that's being uh, evaluated for psoriasis is phase two uh, data, uh, and this is a drug moving uh, moving on to phase three. And if we look at the outcomes on the left, this is a busy slide. I apologize for that. You know, at, at the uh, higher dose, three hundred milligram uh, group, posi ninety. Uh, is uh, its primary endpoint is roughly 66% uh, of patients achieving that out outcome. Uh, so uh, on par uh, with uh, some of our excellent uh, therapies we have uh, available, uh, but perhaps not as eff efficacious uh, as say bimikizumab, uh, which hits POSI 90 at around 85%. Um, duration of treatment, this is a nice uh, study of risenkizumab. Uh, at week 28, uh, patient initially on risenkizumab who achieved skin clear score of clear or near clear were randomly assigned uh, to uh, go on to continued therapy or placebo. And the medium time to a relapse uh, in their psoriasis was almost 300 days, okay? Uh, in the top 25th percentile, some patients took over 400 days to relapse, okay? The median time to loss of posi 90 was 210 days. So this is a, you know, a remittative therapy. And, I, and, and my own view is, is a, a, a major clinical advantage because basically what I tell my patients, it gives them a soft landing. You know, when patients maybe not so adherent or, or in and out of care or have issues with insurance access, you know, it's nice to know that when we're on a, a 23 inhibitor like rizinkizumab, that they have to stop their therapy that it will take a while for most patients for disease to come back significantly. Uh, okay, so I talked a little bit about bimikizumab uh, earlier. Uh, this is now uh, pivotal trial data. Uh, one of the studies that was published in Lancet uh, just recently. And you know, we're highlighting a couple of the endpoints here. You know, the, the POSI 100 at week 16 uh, is 60%. Uh, in the bimikizumab group compared to 21% in the used to kinumab group. Okay, that's pretty remarkable. And 60% of people having 100% clearance uh, of their uh, skin disease um, with bimikizumab. The other thing is it works really fast. Okay, so at week four, uh, three quarters of patients achieved a POSI 75. Okay, that used to be our primary endpoint. Uh, for TNF inhibitors, for example. So that's just dramatic. And so for me in my clinical practice, I really like to bring patients in early when they're on these 17s because I know things are changing very rapidly. And as I talked about earlier in my talk, that experience for the patient of feeling like they're free and out of prison because their skin is clearing, uh, that's a joy to behold with the patient. And to know that they could be achieving that as soon as four weeks after starting their therapy is pretty remarkable finding. Uh, now, a uh, safety profile of this drug is similar to what you would expect uh, for a 17 inhibitor, uh, except the rates of candidiasis seem uh, measurably higher than what we see uh, with the existing um, uh, 17s available. Uh, so in this case, you see oral candidiasis uh, from weeks 0 to 16, about roughly 10% of patients. 
And then over a year's time, uh, 15% of patients develop an oral candidiasis compared to just 1% of people who are on ustekinumab. So this is an important thing to consider with your patients. Uh, it's a fairly significant rate of this uh, nuisance uh, side effect. Um, and it's important to decide when that, that is something that would make you want to use this as a first line agent when it's available, or if you'd want to use it uh, in uh, other therapies and not necessarily works. Uh, also, there's a, it remains a signal uh, of uh, inflammatory bowel disease in this patient population. There's a case that occurred in this clinical trial. Uh, and it's a reminder that the 17 seem to have a signal of inflammatory bowel disease. Again, it's rare, uh, unlikely to occur in these patients. Uh, in this case, one patient had 321 treated. Um, but, uh, you know, it was certainly something that we need to counsel our patients about. All right, uh, advances in the treatment of psoriatic arthritis. So ixekizumab shown in head-to-head -head trials with uh, adalimumab, which is considered to be a gold standard treatment for psoriatic arthritis, uh, but much better skin responses, okay? So when you uh, have um, you know, uh, combined uh, outcomes like a POSI 100 plus an ACR 50, you know, clearly uh, ixekizumab will do better than a TNF inhibitor. Uh, and in this case, the safety profile is uh, you know, very similar. Uh, although, uh, you know, interestingly, there were four malignancies uh, in this particular study uh, in the adalimumab group compared to none in the ixekizumab group. It's not statistically significant, but uh, a little bit of a, of a sign. Uh, on the flip side, you had a couple of cases of inflammatory bowel disease in the ixekizumab group compared to none in the uh, adalimumab group. So, you know, the safety is fairly similar between these two therapies, despite, uh, you know, the different labeling between the two. Um, but, you know, uh, the general feeling, I think, on the dermatology side is that the first line therapy for psoriatic arthritis increasingly really should be considered to be a 17 inhibitor because it seems to do just as well in the joints um, and certainly better in the skin. And um, when I work with my rheumatology colleagues, they've been using TNF inhibitors for a very long time, plus they use them for other diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. So they tend to preference TNF inhibitors as, as their first line therapy. And, and hopefully um, this uh, preference will evolve over time based on the data we're seeing where our patients get better outcomes uh, overall when they're receiving the 17. Uh, similar story uh, with uh, secukinumab. Uh, you get similar responses in the joints, uh, but better responses in the skin with secukinumab compared to adalimumab. And then, uh, you know, kiselkinumab, uh, now FDA approved for psoriatic arthritis. Um, and here, uh, you know, the uh, ACR 20s uh, and uh, 50s and, uh, and 70s were actually pretty compelling, you know, roughly 60% ACR 20 response. Uh, this is, you know, uh, akin to what you might see with a TNF inhibitor. And so we look forward to seeing head-to-head uh, -head trials of the 23s against the TNFs or maybe the 17s. Uh, you know, our, our sort of dogma or way of thinking was that, well, you know, we used to keep a benile 12 23 inhibitor is pretty effective for psoriatic arthritis, but just never seemed to be as effective as the TNF inhibitors, and, and therefore is often going to be a second line therapy for those patients. Uh, but perhaps these type of data will, will change our thinking, and if we get head to head data that will help us understand where the 23s fall in the algorithm for treating people with psoriatic arthritis. The current thinking, I think, is TNFs and 17s have the strongest data in the joints. So what's new? Well, TIC2 is new. Uh, we have new oral medications targeting this pathway. As I mentioned earlier in the talk, TIC2 uh, is a genetic susceptibility loci for psoriasis. So it's exciting to see the sort of translation of genetics uh, to the clinic. A and what you see is in this early phase two trial in the one trial of medicine, uh, that you have you know, good POSI 75 response rates, roughly 70% of patients getting POSI 75 about 40% of patients getting POSI-90. Um, and so this is sort of biologic-like efficacy in an oral molecule. Uh, and this drug is, is in phase three. Uh, we're waiting for the peer review data to come out. So those will be discussed once those are, those are publicly available. Uh, but clearly, uh, this seems like an encouraging uh, medication. Uh, on the safety side, it seems like a safe and well-tolerated medication. Uh, some funny signal here for, for, for folliculitis or acne-like reactions. And we'll see how significant an issue that is uh, in the phase uh, three data, but it's a, a manageable uh, issue to be aware of. Um, and I think, you know, putting this in perspective, you know, we know for our patients that despite how incredibly effective the biologics are and how well-tolerated and safe they are, 
Uh, many patients still just do not want to have an injectable medication. For them, it's just a bridge that's too far for them to cross. And so having oral molecules that are available and, and give us you know, better effective responses will be uh, addressing a real uh, unmet medical need for our patients. So we'll see uh, uh, how this drug does as it goes to FDA approval, uh, whether or not there's lab monitoring requiring or what the label will look like. This promises to be uh, something that will be a big expansion of our therapeutic armamentarium and hopefully get more patients under better control of their disease. Uh, you know, I'll just close there uh, by reminding uh, everyone that, you know, that comorbidities is often a very critical aspect of how we decide what therapy we're going to use for a patient. Uh, certainly, they have comorbid psoriatic arthritis that should change uh, your treatment algorithm of, of what you're going to choose. Um, you know, the, uh, the 17s and the TNFs are generally our first-line therapies for people with comorbid psoriatic arthritis. We now have Gaselkimab approved as an IL-23 IL inhibitors. Um, and that's available as well. You know, the patient has underlying inflammatory bowel disease. We, we showed you the data uh, that IL-17s are probably things you don't want to use in that setting. It can aggravate or induce inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, but TNF inhibitors, some of them are approved for Crohn's disease. Uh, used to kinumab in high doses approved for Crohn's disease. Uh, and we'll see the 23s are being studied for Crohn's disease uh, as well. You know, for people who are uh, very overweight, uh, you generally want to use highly effective therapies or therapies that do, uh, uh, dose by weight. Uh, These therapies uh, lose response or don't respond as well in people who are obese. Uh, you know, cardiovascular disease is a major concern uh, for our patients. It's the, the leading cause of mortality in people with psoriasis. Um, but we don't really know for sure if our therapies, um, you know, change this risk for our patients. So it's critically important to make sure they are educated about cardiovascular risk and have their uh, traditional cardiovascular risk factors managed. The cholesterol their diabetes or their insulin resistance um, and their blood pressure. Um, for things like demyelinization, you know, per person with a history of optic arthritis or multiple sclerosis, you want to avoid TNF inhibitors. Our other therapies, generally speaking, are pretty favorable in, in, in these settings. There's actually some evidence that IL-17 inhibitors may be effective uh, for multiple sclerosis, so that needs to be further studied. Uh, and then for patients with comorbid uh, lupus, uh, you know, used to kinumab has been studied uh, and is safe in that patient population. Uh, Premolast and methotrexate are often used in that patient population as well. Uh, so I'm gonna close there and I'm, I'm delighted to finish a, a little bit early uh, and look forward to taking uh, questions uh, from my colleagues. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you, Dr. Gelfand for that excellent presentation. And we do have a little bit of time here for some questions and I have some audience questions. So um, let's get started. We have a question here regarding um, your preference on treatment for psoriatic arthritis when it comes to the IL-17s and the IL-23s, which do you feel is better? Uh, well, thanks for that question, Matala. It's good to be back with you at the IAS here. Um, so, you know, I, I think, um, you know, speaking more broadly, actually, uh, in the rheumatology literature, uh, there tends to be still a preference for TNFs over uh, the IL-17s to 23s for psoriatic arthritis. But I think those recommendations will change over time because the emerging head-to-head -head trials show that 17s work as well as TNFs in the joints, but obviously outperform in the skin. So my personal opinion is that 17s should be considered to be the first line treatment for people with psoriatic arthritis uh, compared to say TNF since they, they overall treat the disease better. In terms of 23s, we'll need to have more data emerge. You know, the initial data for Tremphia, the Selkimab, I, I think um, exceeded our expectations for how well it would work uh, for psoriatic arthritis. But that being said, uh, IL-23 pathway drugs aren't very effective for axial disease. Um, and so that's a concern of using it in those, in those settings. And we don't have head-to-head -head data of 23s versus 17s or TNFs uh, in psoriatic arthritis. So I think we'll need some more data to decide whether or not they stack up as favorably as with those other two MOAs. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question here. Do you typically check HLA status before picking a biologic agent? You know, that's an interesting question. So yeah, there's this whole field of what's called stratified medicine, a lot of it uh, coming out of the United Kingdom and Europe, uh, where they've been intensively studying, you know, sort of genetic markers of what is likely to be successful for a patient. Um, and th that work is still ongoing. And even, even those who are leading the field feel like it's not quite there yet. 
where it'd be clinically useful to say, all right, you're HOA CW6 positive and therefore I'm gonna choose this uh, pathway versus another pathway uh, because the discrimination is just not that great yet. So currently it's not part of my clinical practice. It's still, as I explained to patients, somewhat trial and error. Great. Um, and maybe one quick comment here. We have um, a PA who's working with a dermatologist and she was asking when it comes to the pediatric patients, her, um, her dermatology um, MD is a little bit hesitant on biologics. Do you have recommendations? She's, he or she is already doing topicals and phototherapy. You know, I, I think one, showing them the data and two, showing them the patient. There's nothing like that experience of a patient suffering with their disease and then you know, talk about an IL-17, for example, and uh, you know, two weeks later, three weeks later to clear, that is really powerful. Okay, great. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us. I will see you in the next session. Thank you, Dr. Gelfan. Bye, everyone.